The following episode of Shower for the Soul contains language or subject matter that might not be suitable for children. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Shower for the Soul, a podcast where we explore today's issues affecting our mental health and well-being. It's all about life, health, and wealth, and us. Grab a chair and a spot around the table, and let's start sharing. Now, here's our host, Shane Fame Alexander. Welcome back to Shower for the Soul. I am Shane Alexander. How are you guys doing? It's episode 11. Episode 11. I lost count. I was just doing some work for the episode just now before I started recording and I lost track. I had to go back into my files and see what the Taylor Swift episode was. And uh, I can't believe it's uh, episode 11. You know, it's when people hit the double digits in ages, you just lose count on how old they are unless they are the same age as you or something, right? So forever, my sisters are going to be 25 because I kind of lost track after that. And my dad's always going to be 45, and my mom's, like, always 40, which means she's younger than me by the year. (laughs) So, yeah, so it's episode 11. You might see every episode after this one just stay at 11 because maybe I just lost track and I just don't know. But just in case I flub out uh, in a later episode, remember that this episode with Aaron Davis was episode 11 in season 2. Or shower for the soul. Before we get to Aaron Davis, I want to talk to you about our friends at BetterHelp. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's a professional counseling done securely online. And you can start communicating with a counselor in under 24 hours. You can read the reviews. They're updated daily at www.betterhelp.com dot com backslash reviews that's betterhelp dot com that's b e t t e r h e l p dot com backslash reviews and if you go to betterhelp dot com backslash s f t s you're gonna get ten percent off your first month that's betterhelp h e l p dot com backslash s f t s and get ten percent off your counseling. Now, if you grew up listening to radio in the 80s and 90s here in Toronto, uh, you were most likely knowing this person. Uh, Aaron Davis uh, had a fantastic career on the radio as the morning lady on CHFI and then later on on Easy Rock and then went back to CHFI. But we're going to be talking about a little bit about that, but mostly we're going to be talking about her book, Morning Has Broken, which she released after she retired. Um, and it's just an honor to speak to this lady. She's, um, you know, larger than life to me just because I grew up listening to her and radio people in my life were larger than life. They were my celebrities. So it was a great honor to speak with the great, the legendary Aaron Davis. And I said to him, what's happened? And he said, Lauren died. And um, I don't remember a lot of what happened after that because uh, it became a blur, but that's why this book was such a collaborative effort because Rob had to fill in a lot of the blanks. So we made our belief back home to Toronto right away and, uh, and, and tried to begin processing what had happened to our only child. Our lives were just shattered, and I said to him at that time, this is... Eons and eons and eons. That's three decades of eons <laughs> of me being in the area of radio I finally get to talk to Aaron Davis. I was always too chicken to call you guys and Don oh. and Cooper. And I think that Tom Rivers would have gone mad at me if I called the competition. So ah. finally get to meet and talk to Aaron Davis. Well, the pleasure's mine. Thank you so much, Shane. Uh, in the shower. You're not actually in the shower right now, right? No, no. That's, okay, good. good. 
That's the R-rated uh, overnight episode. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I have seen a shower head that looks like an old time microphone, like they would have used at the Grand Old Opry, though. And I think that oh, that cool. everybody who has a hand in podcasting or radio or just just loves the medium should look for that shower head. I don't have one because I would just sing into it and nobody needs that. <laughs> yeah, that'd be cool marketing. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So you were uh, speaking of um, of celebrating stuff and uh, cleaning yourself. No. <laughs> that was a really bad segue. Yeah, uh, we can work on that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, two things you're celebrating, the cab induction and your wedding anniversary this past week. Yeah, thank you for uh, acknowledging both. Yeah, the, uh, the, the Hall of Fame is something that I hadn't, it wasn't even on my radar. I don't even know. Uh, like, I know who's in it, obviously, but uh, to be among those is just, uh, it's a real thrill. And I'm i am really excited for May for that to happen. And where's that? Is it still in Halifax or does it tour around? Uh, it's at the, it's in Toronto, um, okay. where, Can where Canada Music Week, Canadian Music Week is held every year. And uh, this time the whole ceremony and Buffy St. Marie is going to go into the music part of the Hall of Fame. And Ed Robertson is going to be performing and there's another artist that I just heard about yesterday and escaped me. Uh, they're going in as well, and it's going to be it's going to be a big night. So I'm really looking forward to it. Awesome. Now, quick story about uh, Tom Rivers and when he was in Halifax. That's why I asked because I knew uh, Tom got inducted in Halifax. But when Nancy went to induct Tom, she took Tom to the awards and. She left Tom under the, her table at the award ceremony. Oh, she had an urn, did she? Yes. Oh, so, wow. Whoops. Uh, yeah. So not, she the got first time, not the first time Tom Rivers was under the table. I think we can all say that. <laughs> right? Yeah, there's a Christmas story about that. Oh, I but, bet. <laughs> but yeah, so she got home and she realized she, lost, she forgot Rivers in Halifax. Oh. So um, I remember her sending me email and letting me give me the dish about the cab awards and she said yes tom's last plane ride was from halifax to california to detroit back home to toronto oh geez that's just the best isn't it typical radio story uh so much indignity and yet we all still laugh because that's who we <laughs> are right yeah. i'd be happy for the pre-trip <laughs> now do you i was going to talk to you about this earlier later on but being um, radio and, you know, all those stories and being on the air and now off the air since you retired, do you miss that? Because I know a lot of radio people, they try to replace that with something else after they retire and they just can't. Well, yeah. I mean, initially when I left CHFI at the end of 2016, I thought, okay, that's it. We're moving out west. We're going to start a new life. And then about four months in, I was contacted by Ocean 98.5, which is the Rogers joint in Victoria. And they said, we need somebody to do middays. And they had me on a nice retainer for a year, which was just beautiful of them. And I thought, well, I'm not earning this money, so I want to do it. So how they set it up, Shane, is that they were able to um, I was able to do my show into a laptop in my studio at home and then upload it to the station. So it was perfect. But what was really valuable, a couple of things. First, it gave me focus again. It uh, mm -hmm. reminded me how much I love radio and I'll never, ever stop loving it. Um, but secondly, it made me immerse myself in Victoria right away because the last thing you want is listen to somebody who doesn't know how to say your street name right, right? Yeah. No, nothing sounds more <laughs> syndicated or out of touch or, you know, just stupid if you don't know where things are or how to say them. And um, and so that, that really did help me. And it really did save me in a lot of ways, too, because I was kind of starting to spiral. I was in the midst of writing this book and it was taking me down. And I missed radio and I missed my friends and I missed my home and Ontario and everything about it. And it just kind of brought me back to life. It gave me a purpose and something to something to look forward to every day. And no matter what stage in life you're at, you've got to have something to look forward to. And that's crazy about radio, too, because I was like that. I remember I went through a lot of stuff back like a decade ago, actually, this uh, 10 years ago, this in two months, uh, my girlfriend commits suicide. And then the year before that, my best friend suicide so it was like Ooh. a lot of p 
PTSD kind of feelings from 2009 to like 2012. Wow. Where, I'm like, so sorry. But you know what? At that time, and I wish I found this out back then, but, and well, back then they didn't even have podcasting, but when, when I was having my worst moments, I would just turn back to radio in a sense of, I'll go on the tube and search out a Tom Rivers bit or something from Chum or something from Don Daynard and just watch it. And I thought I was just being bored and trying to get into the YouTube, you know, dive. Mm -hmm. But yeah, really, I was trying to reconnect with radio. Yeah. Yeah. When it's in your soul, it just doesn't leave you. And um, how lucky, I know how lucky I was to be a part of it. And there will be some people who say the 70s were the heyday or the 50s or the 60s or whatever. Um, to me, my time in radio was the best time of my life. And I'm not trying to recreate it now. I'm, you know, doing a lot of stuff with, uh, with voice work and uh, doing a podcast for the Canadian Real Estate Association and lots of different projects. But I know I'll never go back to morning radio because, A, I love sleeping in in the morning. <laughs> and I promised my husband, for better or worse, that um, that I'm his now. You know, he, he mm -hmm. would always ask me, when do I get my wife? And, um, um, you know, careful what you wish for. But, <laughs> but you know, I'll, I'll never leave it. And I, I love to, to be invited, as you so kindly have done with me, to talk about radio or about anything and just have a chance to, to laugh and, and, you know, again, taking you outside of yourself. It's so important. It is. And, um, you know, with, and how has the book Morning Has Broken help you taking yourself outside of yourself? Was it, well, how about this? Let's talk about why you wrote that book. Well, I would love to say that I, I had this message I had to get out, but I'll tell you, it was one of those things where the universe just kind of is, is smacking you in the head. The last day that I was on the air at CHFI was the day that an event um, that, uh, like, I was a guest on Tracy Moore's City Line show. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I was with her, and in the audience that day was a woman who goes out once a month with her sisters, either to a spa or a play or whatever, and so they went to a taping of City Line. And a couple of days later, she emailed me and said, I think you've got a book in you. And she happened to be the executive vice president, senior publisher of HarperCollins. Wow. So, yeah, it was I was the the lucky minuscule um, percentage who have someone come who had someone come to them and say, write a book. So I felt, OK, um, since Lauren died in May of 2015 of mm -hmm. un, undetermined causes in her sleep, um, since she died, I knew that the, my message from her was, Mom, it's not about you anymore. It's about them. And I took that message to mean helping other people to, you know, to, to travel this road of grief and to, to know that there is some hope along the way and, uh, and, and how to find it, how to get it, how to reclaim joy, as I say in the title. And on the book's cover, there's Hummingbird. Is there a story behind that? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Initially, when the wonderful art department at uh, HarperCollins came to me with an idea, it had, there were the uh, the cherry blossoms around the outside of the cover because, you know, Victoria, cherry blossoms, and yeah, mid-February, they're already out. Um, and then there was a butterfly, which of course metamorphosis coming out of, of the cocoon and all of that. And it was, it was a perfect analogy, except that um, at about the time that I got the artwork, my husband and I were marking Lauren's passing and we'd gone away and stayed at this inn on an island in Washington state. And we came out the morning of her anniversary, May 11th. And just outside the cars, we were loading the car, this hummingbird that had the bright fuchsia breast that our hummingbirds in Victoria don't have, came right at my nose and just hovered there for about one, two, three, four, gone. <laughs> and, and I went, wow. okay, I really need to pay attention to this. And so I went home and I Googled a picture of, um, you know, what that hummingbird looked like sent it to harper collins and they they flew with it quite literally so um yeah that's why the hummingbird and i was just gazing through the book um online and you mentioned the words at least Ooh. as e yeah. yes Ooh, yeah at least those are the two words that no one in grief wants to hear whether you're talking about their dog 
you know, at least you had them for 16 years, mm -hmm. or you're talking about your job, well, at least they gave you a payout, or you're talking about a death. And someone can be in their 90s and you can say, oh, at least he didn't suffer, or at least you had him for all those years, you know, my dad died at whatever age. Or in our case, you know, at least she didn't suffer, at least you have a grandson, at least you still have a husband. And those are things I actually was told. And your initial, my initial response was, oh, that's so kind. Thank you. You're, you're trying to make it better. But those are the two cruelest words because what you're saying, although you don't mean it, is it's not as bad as you think it is. Oh, hell yeah. It's plenty mm -hmm. bad. But the at least mm -hmm. are the ones for us who grieve to say, and I'm sure you can relate to this, having lost your friend and your girlfriend Mm -hmm. um, to such horrific circumstances, the at least are for you to say, you know, and, and, and the, the ways that you find gratitude are up to you, but for someone to say something as inane as God needed another angel, I heard a lot of that, or, you know, the, the, the other sort of the religious platitudes that come from such a place of faith and kindness but if the person you're speaking them to doesn't believe that or isn't ready to believe that, then it's like a gut punch. It really is. Those those two words, at least, are just they're such a cudgel. They're 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 hard, hard words. And I never realized how long how many times you say that mm -hmm. or people say that. That's like the go to. Oh, it always is. I think in our way, we want to say. Well, at least they didn't suffer, um, you know, and, and I, they're trying to find something kind or something bright in all of this, because if you care for someone, you want to show them a little bit of sunshine. But really what it's saying is, oh, it could be worse. Just sit down. And I know it could be worse. There are myriad ways it could have been worse. She could have, her heart could have stopped when she was driving a car. She could have collapsed holding her son on the stairs. She could have died by suicide. She could have been murdered. She could have been a Dateline episode. There are so many ways it could have been worse, but those are our at least to find as, as the people who lose and who've lost, not those who are trying to console with their own you know, their own platitudes. And I do understand, and I want to say it again, that people say things from a kind place and they're just mm -hmm. trying to make it better. But I'm glad to say that those words have really resonated with readers of the book. So hopefully the message is getting through a little bit. Are there any other words or phrases that we should be mindful of that you've noticed that a lot of people say or it's overused? Well, I was interested to hear you say committed suicide because now it's become... And I've learned this through one of the uh, one of the contributors to the book whose son died by suicide, that she despises that verb committed because commit comes from, you know, committing a crime or committing a sin. Yeah. And of course, suicide at one time and still is to some a sin. So died by suicide or even the word suicide has become a verb. They suicided, which I don't actually like. But and, and of course, you're the one who's lost. You get to say yeah. what you want. But those of us who have not, I think, and, and we hear committed suicide on Dateline. Again, I go back to that show, my grief porn, um, <laughs> on, on Dateline or in newspapers and that sort of thing. But I think gradually we're becoming more mindful of, of using that phrase. Have you ever heard that before? Um, no. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's slow. It is slow getting through. And maybe it won't get through. Maybe it's just some people's pet thing because they don't like the, you know, the, the accusatory nature of the word committed. Um, but it's, I thought it was interesting and I try to be really careful about that. I, uh, I heard a story of when, um, the great Larry Silver had to do the news story of Robin Williams. Oh yeah. He said in very Larry Silver way, Robin Williams has chosen his exit to his, from the world on his own terms. Yeah, that's a beautiful way of putting it. And, of course, because of Larry Silver, he got in trouble for that because the news director thought that it made suicide sound okay. But then a woman called the following day and said, thank you for putting it that way because Robin Williams was a hero of mine and that was much a much of a lighter hit, especially reading on social media and how they use those words together and everything. It's just some, you know, I think Larry did a really good job at making it better 
for people to hear. Yeah. Yeah. And, and in media, we were always so careful where suicide was concerned because, you know, if someone jumped on the tracks and, and, and the subway system was going to be down for a long time, no one would talk about why it was. It would be a, a personal injury on track level or, or a personal injury or something. And so, and that was always, and newspapers went through, went by it for years and years and years too, to not bring attention to suicide or not glamorize suicide or not give anyone any ideas. But I don't know. I don't know. That's such a fine line to walk. Are we glamorizing or are we saying someone was, someone just couldn't take it anymore? And this is what happened on a dark Monday morning. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, you know, again, it's it's becoming more prevalent to talk about mental health and about depression and about suicidal thoughts and all of those things. So maybe maybe the message has to change a little bit. I don't know. Greater minds than mine have uh, come up with policies. So I have no idea, Shane. Now, speaking about media, now, as someone in media, and I know you've always been very transparent in whatever happens in your life. Um, even Mike was like that, too, mm -hmm. on, when you guys were teaming up. Yep. What was your responsibility as a media person to send this message after Lauren died and writing this book? Was it something – because I know you you got a lot of flack when you came back. Some yeah. say quote unquote too early. Yeah, I think I think there was a there was a, a little bit of and, and I don't I didn't hear it personally. There were, you know, people will always find something to judge you about because that's how people are. But I just felt that after one month, um there wasn't going to be any more healing that I could do. If I if I left it more than one month, I might not come back. Um and you know what? You talked about during your dark days, you know, going down the rabbit hole of YouTube and rem and rem reminiscing with all of your favorite old clips and people who were like friends to you. And really, I would hope that the mm -hmm. best radio people become like friends to you. And to me, the morning that Lauren died and I heard about it uh, in a hotel lobby in Jamaica, just outside the ballroom where we were getting ready to do our first of a week shows in Jamaica on remote. Um, my instinct after Rob told me and I, I cried and, and walked back into the ballroom after just a few moments because it was, you know, it was six o'clock was to, I first told my producer and then I told Mike and then I sat down getting ready to do the show, which is insanity. I know that, but mm -hmm. uh, abnormal behavior during, uh, 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 what is it? Oh, I'm trying to remember the, the words from Viktor Frankl. Abnormal behavior during abnormal circumstances becomes normal. Um, so me sitting down because there was an audience full of people who had gotten up to watch a radio show. There was the audience back in Toronto. We had sponsors. We had all these commitments. We were ready to do a show. Was insane. And yet it was the only thing in my world that wasn't shaking at that moment. There was an yeah. earthquake and I was hiding under that table with Tom Rivers' ashes, as it were. <laughs> I was I was holding on tight. And to me, instinctively, the thing was to do was to sit down and do a show. And of course, you know, saner heads, which were all of them, prevailed. And and um, and we packed up our stuff and flew home that morning. But it was just I had to get back to radio because it was the only way that I was going to get better. And there's this. There's this little thing that yoga instructors will tell you to do when you're twisted like a pretzel and everything hurts. Put a little smile on your face and it, <laughs> yeah. it, try it. Yeah. It doesn't hurt any less, but it, it, uh, it tells your body you're having a good time. And when I went in there day after day, I found myself gradually like a scuba diver who was running out of air and trying to get up to the surface. And it, every day it was a challenge, but soon it became... It became just as natural as it was before May 11th. So once again, as it always has done in my life, radio saved me. I mean, it gave me my career. It gave me my husband, who I met in radio. It's given me my life, my retirement, everything. And I call it retirement, but it's really rewirement because I'm doing other stuff. So radio was the solid, the, the, the thing that wasn't moving at that time. So I had to go back. Mm -hmm. And now you're... I think over a year now in recovery. Oh, almost. I had 10 years until the end of uh, 2016, right after I left Toronto. I decided I didn't have to answer to anybody anymore. 
And I could see if my drinking had an off switch. I thought, 10 years, come on, it wasn't that much of a challenge. <laughs> and uh, so I was on a flight, we were heading off on vacation, and I asked the flight attendant for a virgin Caesar. The first one was a virgin, the second one was not. So um, I, I tasted it and I went, ooh, vodka, okay, let's give this a try. And I've learned since going into rehab last year, I checked myself into a facility in BC, for six weeks and that um, even if you're not drinking, your addiction continues to grow. And if you just imagine an upward graph and it's growing and growing and you're you're wandering around doing just fine down there on the ground. But if you pick up again, you're picking up your addiction exactly where it is now, not where you left off. And it's a scary prospect. And it was absolutely true. And so I would go on and off, on and off, on and off until last summer. I just thought, no, this is ridiculous. I've got to stop. I've got every reason in the world to drink and I've got every reason in the world not to drink. So which is mm -hmm. it going to be? Which is it going to be? So I chose sobriety and it's been eh, seven months, seven months. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. thanks. Thanks. One day <laughs> at a time. One day at a time, baby. Yeah. And would now would have you shared that if you were still on CHFI or on the radio? Oh, you know what? I didn't. During those 10 years I was sober, I was doing the morning show with Mike. And that was from uh, 2006 till 2016. And, um, you know, we would say occasionally that, you know, um, Mike would say, oh, you don't drink, but blah, 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 blah. And, um, and I just, I didn't want, this is the thing. When people think they know something about you, they, they start creating it in their minds. Mm -hmm. um, that, oh, she sounds hungover, or, oh, she forgot a word, she must be drunk, or, oh, you know, all of these dots that get connected erroneously. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't, I, I would never have, I don't think I would have until there was a really good cause behind it. My cause now is helping other people, if they choose to reach out to me, uh, I offer them support and not advice, because that's not my place. Mm -hmm. Um, and and that's that's my role in all this now. I think I would have gone public with it on the air if there was a really good reason for it and it wasn't just about, hey, look at me. Do you know what I mean? If it's yeah. a cause, it's like someone choosing to come out because for their own reasons, but there's a good reason that they finally feel that they want to do it. And um, so I just, and I'm, I'm pleased don't anyone hear this and say, oh, she's likening, uh, you know, sexual preference to addiction. I'm not drawing those lines at all. It's just an analogy that you do things on your own terms when it's right for you. Mm -hmm. And that's very, like, uh, I went through something 2015 where, well, first was 2009 where I was literally on the floor one night and I kind of like, like the floor was a mirror and I kind of looked at the floor and I was like, oops, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, mm -hmm. this is it. And I called my friend who had just moved to England and I woke him up and uh, cried to him. And he's like, yeah, you're, you're not going to the pubs anymore. And I, and we were friends with the owners of the pubs and he's like, yeah, I'm going to call them tomorrow and make sure you don't go and I still went but I was drinking pop and they were so happy to give me pop because they even saw how I was becoming when I was drunk and um, there were times when my friends said I was the happiest when I was sober but mm. back then I but then I knew how I was what to look out for I knew the warning signs right if you know, there were triggers or anything happening in my life. I knew, okay, yeah, maybe I'll go a bit too much now. Maybe I should cut back and, you know, look for a creative outlet. Maybe I should, you know, write more or, you know, work for Geeks of Beats a bit more and do a little bit more extra work for them and see what I could do that way to get out this this energy of mine. Yeah, you do have to have a purpose. And that's what I found after 2016. It was like, well, who the hell am I now? Because I'd always been CHFI's Aaron Davis since 1988, when I was 24, just turning 25. And before that, radio, 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 since I was 17. And, and if I wasn't doing it anymore, who was I, you know? I, mm -hmm. I missed, I missed, you know, I talk about the things that I missed in Toronto, but I missed, I was so afraid of losing the connection 
with the listeners that I had, they'd made, they'd allow me to be part of their family. And I felt a part of so many of their lives. But fortunately, it's all kept up through my journal. And, you know, I do some other social media, but really the journal is a thing that's the most important. And so that's my way of keeping in touch with them. And the letters and the, well, not letters, the emails and posts and stuff, just, they just keep me going. And I talked to a therapist about this last summer and I said, I know it sounds so superficial and it's like, oh, I got this many likes on my Instagram, you know, that's not me. People are not ever followers or fans, you know, they're, they're just people I know or, or people have connected with over the years. And it just means the world to me. And she said, why would you judge yourself for this? These are people that mean a lot to you and you mean a lot to them, you know, cherish that. So I'm trying, I've, I've let that judgment go and I'm just just continuing as best I can, as everybody does. And I love those journals. Thank you. It was hard cutting down from five a week, but I had to, when I came out of rehab, I said, okay, take away something that's, that's on your shoulders. And I hated letting three out of the five go a week, but um, hopefully it makes for better content when it's, when it's less frequent. And you don't do the audio version of it anymore. No, and I loved doing that. I was doing that um, for about a year, I guess, and uh, it continued when we moved to Victoria. But just looking at the numbers of the people who read it, or listened to it rather, and it was probably 5%, and bless those 5%, but the work that was going into it, especially on Rob's end, it just wasn't really fair. So, um, you know, I thought, well, that's a no-brainer. You know, they've listened to my voice, so now they'll want to listen to the journal. But people are just as happy spending a couple of minutes over their coffee wa- or reading it. So I'm, I'm not complaining. I'm happy with that. And you know what? I was thinking of doing – last season was basically me writing this episode. Like, it just came out. You know, you have, like, five pages. You write, and you're like, oh, this is going to be a really good episode. And it ends up being, like, 12 minutes. Ah! <laughs> so I decided this this season to um, make it more like a radio show, just ad lib, just go by point form. I got to hit this, hit this, and go into this. Yeah. And, you know, and then ends up being my my segments. I'm purely talking trade talk with Aaron Davis right now. Mm. So, but um, but the the segments are going much longer. And I wanted to create this one bit so I would have this one constant, like a call of the day or five ten stupid joke of the day yeah. where people can always come back to. And I had I, I had this blog I used to write on that I didn't broadcast at all, I didn't talk about. And it was just me writing stuff out of my head, no editing, nothing, just getting stuff out. So I found it few months ago and I was like Uh what can I do with this Mm. so I a few weeks after that Larry Fedork released his latest podcast called when I was eight which was stories of one uh, from his childhood he's a great storyteller he's very funny so it was inspired by that but also your journal your audio journals where it's me reading stuff from like 2014 2013 2010 and it's called Shane's Journal. It usually ends on the and every episode of Shower for the Soul. But um, but yeah, you were a big part of um, me getting that creative idea. Oh, well, thank you very much. Thank you. I love doing it. But uh, as I say, it was just, as you know, labor intensive. And um, mm-hmm. oh well, oh well, it was it was fun. And who knows what's going to come next? I I don't know. Like just the development of podcasts and the fact that. Anybody, anywhere can pick up a mic, plug it into their computer and do a show is miraculous. It also makes for a lot of dreck out there, but, you know, the audience (laughs) will decide, right? Mm -hmm. And I was talking with my uh, radio guru, Valerie Geller, who is just the most brilliant consultant in my mind in radio anywhere. And she's got a fantastic book called Powerful Radio, Creating Powerful Radio. And, you know, just her, her mantras of, you know, um, never be boring, be a storyteller, all of these things that, and, and what's in it for the listener, drawing the listener in, not with things like, hey, you know what happened to me yesterday, but the, turning it around and saying, has this ever happened to you? And right away, people are like, huh? She's talking about me. What is it? Has it happened to yep. me? 
And it's it's just, oh, it's so brilliant and so simple. And the other thing is never saying, good morning, everyone. Because I'm not talking to everyone, I'm talking to you, standing there in your bathroom with your towel on, ready to face the world for the day or not ready most of the time. Because, you know, a lot of people are getting out of bed to face a, a, a spouse or a job or a life they don't like. And just, you know, talking to that one naked, vulnerable individual and telling them their day is going to be okay. You know, that's that's my secret and I I'm I love it. I love radio. Oh, <laughs> damn it, Shane. I love radio. Why are you doing this to me? Oh, I miss it. And I do. But a good thing is that you're reuniting with Cooper coming up uh, for the cruise. There's a cruise coming up. Yeah, we're going to, we did this last year and it was springtime tulip time in Amsterdam. And this time we're taking an Ama Waterways riverboat. We're going to start in Basel, Switzerland and go through the Rhine and all the German castles and end up in Amsterdam. And, you know, Cooper came to be with us for Christmas and we went to Vegas for a few days and I've just been emailing him back and forth. We are, we are a, a true radio couple. We're, we're best friends. He loves me and Rob and we love him deeply. He loved his wife, Debbie. And, uh, and we've been through now, we've been through the grief ringer together and separately, but, but we know our, we know our common trajectories here. And we've just got the deepest love and fondness for each other. And 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 to go back to, um, well, I'll talk about the cruise in a sec, but you mentioned my anniversary off the top. The first person that I emailed when something amazing happened last night, we're not talking about sex, um, was was Cooper. Because, you know, we, we like to gamble a little bit. And, um, and so Rob and I, we went out to dinner last night. Okay, nice restaurant. And we could only get in early because, you know, five o'clock. So we rushed off to dinner at five. It's 7.30 and we're done. And we're like, okay, what do you want to do now? Well, I had been riffing during the day because the day's date was 2002-2020. This was our <laughs> anniversary. And I went, look at all these twos. How can we not be going to Vegas? So he said, <laughs> Okay, let's go to the casinos. And there's there's a bunch of them around here. And so we went to a casino and I played a little bit on quarters. I a little bit. I, I got up to six hundred dollars on a hundred dollar bill. And I never ever put that kind of money in. So anyway, I, I walked away with half of that because I'm an idiot. And then I decide I'm gonna play nickels. That's my comfort zone is playing nickels. I am not a big spender. I'm sitting down and wasn't I dealt four twos. I was dealt four twos on Whoa. three on three lines, uh, and this is in deuces wild. So four deuces is worth a thousand nickels, but it was doubled. It was two thousand, and then there was another thousand in the middle, and on top it was doubled again. So five thousand nickels, and um, so that was a really nice little treat with the four twos in our anniversary. And Cooper was cool. the first one I sent a picture to, and he gave me a picture. <laughs> A very naughty response about his pants. And anyway, because <laughs> that's who we are. Yeah. So, yeah, the cruise, we have a lot of fun. Um, and, and a bunch of the people who went last year are going to do it again this year. And uh, and we are trying really hard this year to make it just our group on the boat. Because last year, all the other people on the boat wanted to take part in our oldies dances, our parties that we were oh, throwing no. Oh, yeah. And so we said, yeah, come on in. But we're crazy Canadians. So hold on to your hat. As long as it's not a MAGA hat, then we're going to throw it over. Um, but yeah, we had a blast and we thought, oh, this would be great if we could just do it. Just us. And so, so far, I think we've got about three quarters to 80 percent of the uh, of the cabins booked and we've got our fingers crossed. But now coronavirus has got people going, oh, I don't know if I want to get on a boat. Yeah, yeah, but who knows? I'm not worried about it, you know. I'm just not. I'm done worrying about dying. I'll tell you that, Shane. It really just, you just kind of go, okay, well, when my number's up, I get to see my daughter again. So, yay. So, there mm -hmm. you go. Another way of looking at it. And your book is available everywhere, I guess? On yes, chapters? sir. Yeah, except yeah. the chapters in Ajax where it's already sold out. Amazing. Yeah, it came out in soft cover on the uh, 18th of February and it sold out there already. So, yeah, and on Amazon and I don't know if Walmart and Costco are going to carry the soft cover version as well. Um, I haven't been in touch really with HarperCollins about the the whole plan for its layout uh, or rollout as much as I was last year, because, because of course there's the big splash, the media, all that, and then the soft cover cover comes out, and it's it's quite obviously a soft launch too. But 
hey, whatever happens, happens. It's all a gift. And all I want is for people to get the message. Nobody gets rich writing a book in Canada. I want to put that out there, except if you're writing about hockey and sell the book at Christmas time. And I didn't make that up, but it's sure <laughs> true. <laughs> Yes, I'm going to buy one um, as soon as I get off the air here from Amazon. Well, you know what? Um, let me get in touch with my publicist and we'll say we're going to do a podcast and she'll send you one. So, oh, okay. yeah, I, I know people. I know people. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> okay, Shane. That'd be awesome. All Thank right. You. Thank you, Aaron, so much. It was an honor. Thank and, you. And um, hopefully we'll come back next season on Shower for the Soul and talk about something else. Absolutely. And if anyone wants to reach out to me about anything we've talked about, AaronDavis.com is my website and that's how to reach me. Anything. All right. See you later, Aaron. Thank you so okay. much. Okay. All right, um, Shane, turn off the water in the shower. We're wasting energy now. <laughs> okay. was that <laughs> what just dropped oh that was my keyboard okay cool i would like to thank again aaron davis for chatting with us it was just a great honor to speak with her and how uh she was opened um to speak about everything and didn't really hide anything back and you know what it was that kind of uh radio announcer back in the day that i truly grew up idolizing i i was you know growing up with rivers and cooper and even aaron davis where they didn't really hide that much about their life or um, what was happening behind the scenes. And I really admired that. And that's how I like to do my show. And it's mainly to do with those, those radio announcers that I grew up with, including Aaron Davis. So thank you again, Aaron Davis, for being so open. And uh, be sure to check out her book, Morning Has Broken. It's on Amazon and all the great outlets where you can get books. Next week on the show, we're celebrating International Women's Day. Yeah. So if you have any comments, if you have a story to share with me that you think would be really cool for International Women's Day, hit me up on email. It is hostshane at gmail.com. You can also get at me at uh, – look at me using all these urban languages. Uh, <laughs> uh, you can also hit me up or slide into my DMs at – uh, SFTS pod CST that's at SFTS pod CST and that's on Twitter and the Instagram thank you again for joining us and thank you again to betterhelp.com for letting the show happen you can go to betterhelp.com backslash SFTS to get 10% off your first month of online counseling, all the links will be on our website at shanefame.com. Till next week, be well, take care of yourself. Star for the Soul is written and produced by Shane Fame Alexander. Shar for the Soul is a Fame and Friends production. Wow.